Baby, hold me like you don't want to let go. I'm feeling like sick, but you're working it out. Oh, you're giving me a taste of your honey. I want the whole beehive. Oh, give me your sugar. Very underrated Beyonce song in my opinion. Work it out. Okay, anyway, hi. Hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. However, I already have my makeup on. I have no real excuse for it other than... I just sometimes like to sit in silence and put stuff on my face. <laughs> and before I knew it, my makeup was already done and I was like, wasn't I supposed to film today? <laughs> okay, curl pattern. I hate my hair, not because it don't look good, but because I can't. it's so temperamental. It's such a diva. I just realized this is gonna lead in really well into my ad read. That was not on purpose, but okay, that's this works out. Um, Because I've been doing my own hair recently because it's hot as f like have a wig on when it's just gonna melt off my head unless I get glue. And the last time I got glue, I had no edges. I was walking around looking like Vegeta and it was a bad thing. I am this close from shaving my head bald. So yeah, we're gonna send it over to Admiral Kenny for a very topically uh, appropriate ad read. Hello everyone, it's Admiral Kenny and today's video is sponsored by Function of Beauty. Function of Beauty allows you to create and customize your very own specific to your specific head shampoo and conditioner. Rather your hair straight, curly, kinky, coily, dry, oily. Did that rhyme? Bars. <laughs> you'll be able to customize your own specific hair type via their quiz and you will be sent out product that is very representative of you. You can pick the color, you can pick the scent. I pick like a coconutty scent and the amount of scent, which is also very important and underutilized and underrepresented. I don't wanna smell like a whole pina colada, but just like a pina colada walked by. And a cute little purple like lavender moment. I was very into it. But Function of Beauty provides high quality ingredients and high quality formulations. Again, designed to cater to your specific needs and to cater to your specific needs throughout the year, throughout different seasons. Sometimes you need something a little lighter in the summer and maybe some more deep conditioning in the winter, but that way you can customize stuff that matches you year round. Me personally, um, the summer is a time where I want to wear my hair out more. I wear wigs quite frequently, but it is hot. I can't go walking around with a hair hat all the time. And so I want my hair to be moisturized, taken care of, but not weighed down. Being that it is summer, I've been swimming more. My hair was going through it. <laughs> crap ton of chlorine in my hair and my hair feels brittle and and really rat burr nesty after I get out of the pool. And so when I come in, shower and use like a good gentle cleanser and conditioner, it's all good. So I customize something for my particular hair type. Generally speaking, my curl pattern is somewhere around a 3C, 4A. And I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty skeptical because I'm not, you know, so, you know, we particular. This was a really good moisturizing shampoo that I really enjoyed, but it also got my hair clean. So it wasn't just like rubbing more oil on top of dirty hair. But yeah, my hair is quite dry. It tangles on itself a lot, especially cause it's quite long at this point. I wanted something that allowed me to detangle my hair, moisturize my hair, clean my hair, and my hair can be fluffy and I can live out my free mane fantasies. So yeah, feel free to check out Function of Beauty. I will link them down below. And if you use my link, you'll get 20% off of your first purchase and your first customized set. Big thanks again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. That's so much better. <laughs> so uh, last week we talked about, um, oh God, uh, King Batch's movie. Apparently he, he made a movie a few years ago. It's called Where's the Money? It had a bunch of people that you recognize in it. It had Logan Paul, which doesn't surprise me, but it also had Terry Crews, Mike Epps, uh, Method Man, Cat Graham, Rita, Retta. Um, the dude that played Ned and Ned's Declassified. He drops an N-bomb, by the way, for you. Um, yeah, so if you wanna check that out, and if it at all sounds like a riveting experience for you, uh, that'll be linked up above, or you can check it out in the Bat Movies and a Beat playlist. It's been a while since I have felt this particular level of excitement talking about a film. Not every movie has this level of terribleness. And when I see a movie that particularly has this quality, I can't help but get a little giddy about it, regardless of the subject matter. 
I am talking about a film that um, is famous for being bad. That is its sole notoriety, like its only value. <laughs> it is a legend of suckery, a level of which has only been seen by the likes of camp Classics such as Showgirls, Mommy Dearest. Of recent film that have come out like this, I think of Shyamalan's Old, which apparently is getting a new resurgence on Twitter. People have discovered it. Thank God. My my video, I have a video on it. <laughs> Watch my video. I went to the theaters to see it twice. It's a masterpiece. Anyway, as I like to understand it, it's film that is earnest in every way, wants to be good, but instead ends up being so bad and downright offensive that uh, only weirdos such as myself can find any value in it just because I love garbage. Hello, if you're new. <laughs> Those films that I had mentioned before, Mommy Dearest, Showgirls, and even to some degree old, I think it's starting to get its cult. Um, this movie didn't seem to have that at all. It is known categorically for being terrible and that's it, not because it has a cult classic following. And I'm not saying that it deserves one, but it deserves an episode on <laughs> <laughs> Today we're talking about a movie that sole legend, sole history is being bad. More so than what the movie's even about. Arguably, no one knows unless you've seen it. And the thing is, no one's seen it because it was so bad that it got pulled from theaters after like three weeks. That is, of course, 2003's Geely. So originally I wasn't even watching this movie for Bad Movies in a Beat. I was watching it for my podcast. For those of you that don't know, I have a podcast on More Butter where I talk about uh, movies that did really poorly in the box office or got really bad ratings and I watch them and decide whether or not they deserved it. It's called In Defense Of. I They give me a gavel. We have like a judge shtick. You know, it's a fun time. Once I started actually watching it, this deserves every person that could possibly see a video from me to see it. <laughs> it cannot be simply restrained to a 20 minute podcast. It must have its own deep dive via bad movies in a beat. Not every bad movie excites me, especially with the amount of bad movies I've seen over the course of this series. Most of them are actually incredibly underwhelming and I watch them for your benefit. I will guilt trip you <laughs> at every chance I get. If you made me watch a boring bad movie, I cannot. Give me some mess, give me chaos, make it campy, like give me something. In my opinion, as a obvious professional in this film, <laughs> There's a difference between bad, bad movies and good, bad movies. And there is such thing as having bad taste in bad movies. You need to know which one is a good, bad movie and which isn't. This. Is this a good, bad movie? I don't know. It's a, it's a viewing experience. <laughs> this movie is terrible in every way possible. Every decision that could have been made correctly was made wrong. In, in ways that truly astound me. Um, that confused me on how they were able to get it on theaters at all, let alone there for only three weeks. <laughs> Every decision, directorially, writing-wise, uh, music, post-production, every decision that was made by those group of people were bad decisions. And for that, it created something so peculiar, so off-kilter that it achieves that beautiful, you meant to make a good movie, but you made this phenomenon, the showgirls effect. <laughs> so whenever I meet a movie that is so bad, but also in a weird way, arrogant and not self-aware enough to know that we're laughing at it, I get a true joy. You can't really find on purpose often. It's like something that you end up watching because people said this movie is bad. There's a very particular curiousness that goes along with people that thought they were making a decent movie and they made Geely. <laughs> like, as I was watching this movie, I started to liken it to somewhat of like a long drawn out incel rant on Reddit, filled to the brim with offensive shit posting, long spiraling debates about the way things are versus the way they should be, an unending, undeserving high and mighty rant about what it's like in a man's world, all enveloped in a tonally jarring blanket of rage, sadness, and shame. I truly believe to some degree this movie thinks it's a good movie or originally thought it was a good movie before it was rewritten a million times. Spoiler, it's been rewritten a million times and that's how it 
the end product became that. You can still see echoes of the original movie that really took itself very seriously. There, Much of this movie is told in like a long drawn out monologue about nothing. Well, ironically, what I'm doing. This movie feels like a long drawn out monologue about nothing for two straight hours. This is how I shoehorn my particular view and life perspective into a story that didn't need nor ask for it. Feels like a circle jerk of soliloquy. Ooh yeah, let me rub out this new found monologue, this whole rant about how lesbians are just trying to be diet men. Just wax poetic about gender dynamics in the midst of a rom-com that is not self-aware enough to know that it is the butt of the joke here. Speaking of which, I think I should mention that this is a rom-com. In and of itself is one of the most befuddling aspects of this film, because come to find out, it was originally meant to be a crime drama, like a dark comedy, but a, a crime drama. So there's a lot of tonally strange things that enter into this movie that doesn't fit like an early 2000s rom-com. Back in 2003, when people gave a fuck about people's relationships way more than they need to, like in a way that's very disturbing, a lot of people were obsessed with the pairing of Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. They were called Benifer. Y'all remember that? It was a big deal. Like they didn't have other news cycle shit to talk about, I guess. So they were talking about, did you guys see how they went on your yacht? Like who the f cares? Anyway, and whoever was writing the movie thought this is a great way to cash in on people's weird obsession with the Benefer relationship. Therefore, instead of keeping it as a crime drama, they decided to switch it over to a rom-com. <laughs> Around this time, J-Lo was doing other works like Made in Manhattan and the one with, um, the Wedding Planner with uh, Matthew McConaughey. I really liked that movie. And then being that they were two people that were a very hot couple, they wanted to see them be in love on screen to feel as though they're getting some form of voyeuristic look in on the secretive couple. But being that it was originally supposed to be a darkly comedic crime drama, they um, kind of, all they really did was just like keep the general format of the movie, add some random quirky scenes where she meets his mom and then added a very inappropriate rom-com soundtrack to the back of some really jarring and very uncomfortable scenes. And thus, the tonally confusing cluster was born. Have you ever seen a film have an identity crisis while you're watching it? Have you ever seen a film get insecure? If it weren't so offensive, I would say that it would deserve a cult classic status, but there's a lot about it that's very just not great. And I feel like some people wouldn't get that we're laughing at it and not with it. So I, I don't wanna sit here and claim that it deserves that. <laughs> but one of few movies that have left me with this particular feeling of excitement because the movie is just, oh, it makes you wanna lick your lips, it's so bad. <laughs> Delicious. I do feel like this movie has somewhat of like a Mommy Dearest quality to it. And what I mean by that is like Mommy Dearest, if you haven't seen my video on it, I spent like half of a full hour disclaiming that this movie is disturbing, but because it's made so poorly and acted so poorly and written so poorly, it turned into this odd campy weirdness that makes you laugh, even though the, the subject matter is not at all funny. That's kind of what this movie is. You wanna be offended, but you can't because the movie itself is so pitiful. Again, liking it back to that incel rant analogy I was making. Like sure, the, the term femoid is incredibly offensive, but also kind of hilarious because how pitiful are you to call somebody a femoid? <laughs> and because it lacks the self-awareness to know it's being laughed at, it makes it all the more funny. That's this movie. That's what makes this movie funny and that's what makes it mockable. And mocked, it was. Like I said, I, I am doing an episode of In Defense Of on it. I don't know if it's gonna be out yet or if it's coming out next week by the time you see this video, but keep an eye out on that. You can subscribe to More Butter if you want to. I Talk more about specific ratings and critiques and the hemorrhaging of money that took place uh, with the movie in that way. Um, but this, this is where we're gonna do a breakdown of the film, of scenes themselves. Let's talk about what the movie is actually about. Again, a thing that people never really talk about. Gili, uh, with the second G being silent, is the story of a man named Larry Gili, a lowly thug assigned to kidnap the psychologically challenged younger brother of a powerful federal prosecutor to save his mobster boss 
from incarceration. He's just been given his big break. There's a certain witness with psychological defects, <laughs> and I want him held on to. But he's about to get... <laughs> he's kidding, he's kidding. ...an even bigger surprise. Hello. For some reason, his boss gives him uh, this incredibly important job to kidnap this child for ransom, this teenager for ransom, but he simultaneously thinks he's too stupid to do the job. So he ends up hiring someone else, a, another independent contractor, a woman named Ricky, or who calls herself Ricky, that's played by Jennifer Lopez, to like, for them to like babysit each other um, while they try to do this job. I don't know why he didn't just hire her to do it, um, but okay. So that's the like core of the movie. They're gonna be kidnapping this person and holding him for ransom. And so because that's the basis, we have this very weird, incredibly tonally confusing, oddly horny, deeply disturbed experience. So without further ado, this is the infamous Gili 2003. So the movie begins with a title screen. Duh, of course, but I bring this up for a very specific reason. The music. The music is that kind of jaunty, old navy, summer sale commercial music that you expect from early 2000s rom-coms. Nothing that would uh, be confusing for you if you expect it to walk in and see a rom-com. It's something lighthearted and jaunty. But what we come to realize is that this music is used throughout the movie in some of the most inappropriate times possible. And then when they don't use it, they just keep it silent. So there's this like, this big jarring, disconnect between like jaunty tune, jaunty tune, jaunty tune, somebody getting their thumb cut off and then they turn the music off. It's so amazing, I'm sorry. But more on that later, cause it comes up throughout. Uh, we meet our titular character, Larry Gili, a greasy Italian mob boss who is seemingly like breaking the fourth wall, talking to us, roughing us up or whatever. He's actually talking to uh, or interrogating rather someone who owes his boss, Louis, um, some money. This is when we get the first of many long drawn out monologues. This is one of the shorter ones, but I guess this is a good time for me to bring up that this movie is written in monologue. <laughs> there, I've never seen a movie do this before. I don't know, or I just have never noticed it, but a lot of this movie isn't like conversation, like between two people. It's one person going on a long drawn out speech, a soliloquy, a, a little like a lecture of sorts by themselves to sound deep. And then another person joining and doing their own long drawn out profound speech afterwards, but they're not like talking to each other. <laughs> Here we get a hint of that. Well, because the guy's mouth is uh, wrapped up, but. A well, human body is like 80% moisture, right? I figure if you could somehow extract 80% of that, you'd have 34 pounds. Solid, not meat. It'd be more like beef jerky. Like a henchman, he goes in to rough people up. Um, soon after this, we end up meeting Lewis. Um, what I find funny is that um, while in front of another guy that he's shaking down, uh, Lewis turns to Gigli and calls him Giggly or Jiggly. I'm gonna have to send Jiggly over. And he's gonna have to settle up with you. And say, you come to me tomorrow or he goes to you tomorrow. My name is G pronounced Gigli, it rhymes with really. Which I found funny because I was like, this is obviously to let the audience know like a like a like a little tagline like no it's pronounced Gili like really just to get us to remember the movie but i i loved how it made no sense because like isn't he your worker wouldn't he know are you new like are you new at the job did he just meet you which is important because he ends up treating him like he's this trusted henchman or that he's a complete idiot so like when did y'all meet? I don't know if you just checked out his resume on Indeed or something, but, but being that this is a movie, Lewis has to give him a thing to do, right? So he decides to give this dude who, he doesn't know well enough to pronounce his name correctly, <laughs> the biggest job of his life. 
That is to kidnap a federal prosecutor's developmentally disabled younger brother and hold on to him for collateral as they essentially try to intimidate him into dropping the charges of a fellow mob member that's out in New York. So Gili goes to, I guess, the housing facility that the kid is kept at. His name is Brian. Um, and I'm like, oh, f Oh no, um, I must, I, I should have done this earlier. I must warn you that this movie is incredibly ableist. This movie is incredibly homophobic, misogynistic, because again, it is the incel rant thing that I was talking about. Brian is going to be under Gili's care and it's gonna be ultimately his modality to becoming a better person. You know, the rom-com whole thing. Uh, somebody has to turn him into a better person than himself, you know? So we meet Brian and he's talking about how he wants to go to quote unquote, the Baywatch, presumably confusing the TV show for like a destination that you can go to where a bunch of pretty women are and where he can meet pretty women. But Gili is able to persuade him to come with him uh, saying that they're gonna go to the Baywatch, right? And I'm sitting here like, where's the fucking staff? Like, wh why is no one, do you can steal a whole human out of the building and no one noticed like and so he brings brian back to his home ding dong here comes a ring at the doorbell and here it is it's a woman a hot woman it's jennifer lopez who plays a girl named ricky and she comes in asking to use the phone incredibly suggestively it was very weird it had a vibe of like early 2000s like hbo porno <laughs> like yeah you can fix my pipes can i use your phone i can use your phone she doesn't say that but it's the vibe you know <laughs> she goes in she gets on the phone she calls and whoever she's trying to call doesn't pick up and then suddenly she asks to talk to Gili privately being that this movie was turned into a rom-com they decided to put one of the quintessential tropes that are completely necessary in romance which is enemies to lovers you got it so they decided to make the most poorly written and contrived enemies to lovers setup I've ever Scene. And this is when I really started to realize, oh, I'm watching a masterpiece of shit. Literally, she comes into the house, complete stranger. She's like, you're a fuck up. But I gotta tell you, I'm frankly amazed at how much of a fuck up you actually are. Let you know that Lewis hired me because he didn't think you were good enough at your job. Okay, what's that got you mad about? Like, <laughs> he doesn't believe that you have the necessary prowess to do something like this. Okay, I didn't take the job, bitch, I don't want it. <laughs> you know what, there's no reason for you to take my word for precisely how second rate he considers you. It'd probably make both our lives a lot easier if you just heard it directly from him. And so this hostility that has no footing, that has no grounding becomes the basis for their sexual tension. It's confusing. Cause I'm like, you just mad. <laughs> you just came in was like, oh, I have to do my job. Geely calls Lewis to confirm that indeed he did hire somebody else. So after he hangs up, Ricky's like, it's fine. Let's put this behind us. Why don't you just get yourself straight and we can put this whole thing behind us. Bitch, put what? We don't have any, there's no basis for this hostility. This is around when I start to notice the pattern of monologues in this film. Cause they each go on to their own subsequent ones about how they're the biggest, like most reputable gangster in the biz. I am the fucking sultan of slick, Sadie. I am the rule of fucking cool. You wanna be a gangster? You wanna be a thug? You sit at my feet, gather the pearls that emanate forth from me. Cause I'm the fucking original straight, first foremost pimp Mac Hustler, original gangsters, gangster. I was just confused and disgusted up until this point. And then I started to realize, oh, oh, I think I know what I'm watching here. And it's very, very funny. <laughs> because throughout listening to all the monologues, it got to the point where I started to realize that I'm not watching a character anymore. I'm literally listening to like the avatar of the writer of the film. The writer wanted to make these long drawn out profundities on film, wrote various characters to kind of auto fellatio himself the whole time. That sheer thought, <laughs> again, incel manifesto type vibes, was so funny. That's when I knew that I was watching something that truly was a moment of failed seriousness. And I can't help but laugh at that. And I can't help but in some way find it kind of like sadistically funny. <laughs> when I get around to talking about the, how the lips on the face and the lips on the coochie are the same thing, they gonna lose their 
kind. <laughs> like, nigga, no, they're called the same thing. <laughs> like, so Julie ends up harassing Brian for no fucking reason. Again, that tonal shift, like we went from a rom-com to you abusing someone. <laughs> Ricky comes in and she's like, what are you hitting him around for? We're supposed to take care of him. And I had the disturbing realization that this was supposed to be a jumping off point for more sexual tension. There was no reason to do this, but for this to be another point of animosity between them that's supposed to lead towards sexual tension. <laughs> Leave him alone or I'll kill you. But it's like horny. Like this movie uses like horniness to gaslight you, it's like, yes, this is a rom-com. Follow along, do you hear the music? And it becomes like a focal point for their like sexual tension, their animosity towards each other. Whether or not we should be cool abusing the kid that we kidnapped. <laughs> this is a good scene to show the quality I'm talking about, but him and Ricky are talking and they play the rom-com music. So what do you normally hire out for? I do jobs of various types. When he starts yelling at Brian for no reason, mind you, they turn the music off and it's just awkward and jarring and uncomfortable. It's not very good food. Too bad, that's your dinner, eat it. Listen to me, you little fucker. Eat your food. Hey, and I'm like, wait a second. I thought we were supposed to be in a chill enemies to lovers thing. And now you're abusing the disabled, like what? And then this movie, because Julie is the main character has this feel that we're supposed to be inherently sympathetic to him because he has a dark past or what? Fuck that nigga. I am struggling so hard to explain to you guys the viewing experience of watching this movie. Cause it is like, oh, only few. I want to say like no other, but like, no, there is, there, mm, well, actually, this movie might be like no other, and let me tell you why. It's both failed seriousness and failed comedy. Because the movie was originally supposed to be serious to some degree, but it was also supposed to be a dark comedy. And then they turned that dark comedy into a rom-com. So it handles all of those genres horribly at the same time. Drugs, the only thing it could be, it must be drugs. That night, Brian asked to be read to, but Geely doesn't own any books. I'm too cool a guy to be literate. So he reads to him the back of a Tabasco bottle. For well over a century, the adventurous flavor of Tabasco sauce has fired up generations of thrill seekers. But I guess this is supposed to show that he does have a heart to some degree. The only thing I really thought about it was that that's some interesting product placement. I don't even like Tabasco and I considered, I considered buying a bottle. And then Gili, ever the gentleman, offers Ricky his bed so that they can share it, quote unquote, professionally. For some reason, Gili thinks he's getting laid. I don't know why you would think any interactions you've had with anyone at this point would lead to you having sex, but okay, sure. Ricky's like, no, for a lot of reasons, but particularly because she's a lesbian. If I wasn't. I mean, after a first date like this, I find it really hard not to just get under the covers and do you big time right now. Good night. Please tell me that this is not gonna be a I'm gay for everyone but you story <laughs> in which she probably won't kiss a woman and the only person she'll have any sexual contact with is the man, clairvoyance, baby. So anyway, one day, in comes this dude. Apparently he's a cop, but there's no indication about why Gili should know this cop, why this cop seems comfortable enough to him to go to him for any reason. Acts as though they're relatively close. So I'd say it's probably important to know how they know each other, but they don't give us any of that information because this movie sucks dick. But he goes in and he's like, hey, us cops, we're looking for that boy. Uh, he's a federal agent's younger brother and we're gonna find him. So if you hear anything in the underground, let us know. Why would you let the f underground know that you're looking for it? <laughs> like this encounter is incredibly tense and uncomfortable, but not because it was well written, but because it's just, they didn't have the rom-com music on. <laughs> this scene happens. Man, you know what I'd love to do? Go down to Marie Callender's. Get me a big bowl of pie, some ice cream on it. Mm-hmm, good. Put some on your head. Your tongue would slap your brains out trying to get to it. Interested? Sure. But obviously the police are on to him now. They decide to go out and get away from the heat a bit. So Brian asks to go to the Baywatch again and Geely lies to him again and says that it's closed. Ricky asks him, what is the Baywatch? And 
they start playing the rom-com music. I think that's where the sex is. I think so. Oh my god. What the f*** is going on? <laughs> they go out to get food and there Gigli gets into an argument with some men that are sitting at a different table because their music is too loud, which seems like a really bad idea if you're trying to be undercover, but I digress. Ricky, who says to him, we're supposed to be undercover, decides to go up to the guys who are making too much noise and she has a monologue. There you go. And she goes on for like three f minutes about some form of martial arts that'll help you be able to rip someone's eyes out and make it erase their memory. Kaitoi mai. Loosely translated, that's the rip that takes the past. Once the thumb liquefies the eye, it is definitely and immediately replaced by the forefinger. Deep thrust, hooking around and securing the ocular nerve, then removing it with such force as to bring with it, by suction, a vital portion of the visual cortex. The extraordinary element of this movie, the genius of it, the, the absolute poetry of it. One's opponent is left with no memory of anything he has ever seen. Hence, Another thing that makes Gili slowly fall in love with the unavailable woman. Is suckmydick.com. They have further monologues, this time about Sun Tzu's art of war. Again, why the rom-com music plays. And this somehow bleeds into her starting to psychoanalyze Gili about his anger issues and probing at what exactly are you so sad about? And I was like, are we really f do Yeah, we are. Why am I surprised? She's gonna manic pixie her way into psychoanalyzing the abusive dick nugget. Still supposed to think it's a rom-com because of the f music. Now being that this is a rom-com, we have to have this really weirdly placed detour to meeting Gili's mom and her ultimately approving of uh, Ricky, even though she's a lesbian and doesn't know that they're not together. In very early 2000s rom-com fashion, the mom is a very eccentric woman who wears a thong and needs to take her medication via shots to her ass. The whole like, we did change this into a rom-com, so we have to have the mom approves type thing. But they do end up telling her like, oh, Ricky's Ricky's gay. And the mom is basically like, eh, I've been there too. Keep an open mind though. And there's also like this weird kind of eroticism between the mom and Ricky. I guess they trying to fuck or something, but they never do it. But there's this like horniness there too. And I'm just like, what is going on? That night, Ricky is doing yoga and Gili comes in and they both have those two separate monologues I was talking about. Uh, they're both about each of their genitalia. And uh, he goes, Full on lesbians are inferior at sex because they buy items that make up for their genetic lacking, which is, ooh, okay. Uh, and he goes on and on and on. Okay, when it comes to pleasing a woman, your girlfriends, they're just, they're at a natural disadvantage. That's why these lesbians are always going out and buying, you know, spending all their dough on sexual appliances, erotic monkey wrenches and shit, trying to compensate. It's very design. Tells you everything you need to know. Forward motion of advancement, fucking progress. And she responds to his homophobia in a rebuttal speech, which also goes on and on and on. And all creatures big and small seek the orifice, the opening to, to, to be taken in, engulfed. If it's design you're concerned with, hidden meanings, symbolism, and power, there is no place nowhere that has been the object of more ambitions, more battles, than the sweet, sacred mystery between a woman's legs that I am proud to call I think accumulatively it ended up being five minutes of them each doing a speech. <laughs> this is just no way to make a movie, man. I mean, I think if she went at a poetry slam, she'd really kill it though. Remember when I said that this movie is incredibly jarring tonally? So after that very long and admittedly flowery scene, Lewis calls the next day and tells Geely to cut off Brian's thumb and send it via the mail. <laughs> this was going to be a threat to that prosecutor so that they know they mean business. I guess at some point along the way, I don't know when, uh, he decided to stop being abusive to their kidnappy. He's, I guess, slowly, begrudgingly 
come to enjoy reading the back of Charmin toilet paper wrappers uh, to help him go to bed at night. Again, that product placement was slick in the early 2000s. Ricky does her manic pixie dream girl purpose and asks Geely about his friends, about his life, about him being a lone wolf. And he's like, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. <laughs> Different places, sorry. And then he informs her of the thumb thing. They're both conflicted about the duties they have been asked to do. The next day, a random blonde woman comes to the house and says, I've been stalking Ricky. What are you doing here? I'm stalking you. Apparently she's an ex and apparently she's insane. And she's like, fine, let's have a threesome. And she's like, no, you don't want to have a threesome? Fine, I'll kill myself. <laughs> Just like, what the f there was so much whiplash, I didn't know. I felt like I was in the office and I was just trying to figure out what camera do I look at so that someone knows, are you seeing this shit? I was like, why, why, why did you add this? And I realized once they take her to the hospital and start the rom-com music again, <laughs> that this is supposed to be another jump off point where Gili realizes that Ricky is just so compassionate. She was concerned about her ex nearly dying of died in front of them. And he's like, wow, what a woman. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> she never comes back again, by the way, the crazy ex. She's just God for the, that is, she was there. She was crazy and she left. They have a conversation in front of the hospital about how we need to figure out something to do because we can't chop off Brian's thumb. We gotta be better people. So she's like, I have a plan. Are you with me? Sure. See, if I were to ask you to move my couch for me, you'd probably say sure. But if I were to ask you to look deep into my eyes and tell me from the bottom of your heart, if it would give you great pleasure if I were to suck your cock for 12 hours, if I may be presumptuous, you'd probably say yes. It must be drugs. I don't know. I can't. I don't have any other explanation. <laughs> this movie is demented this movie is f insane they devise a plan to get into the hospital and sneak into the morgue in particular to cut off one of the corpse's thumb and mail it again again all with rom-com music in the background he chops off a thumb with what seems to be a butter knife and the next day they mail it off while there Gili notices that ricky and the clerk was making eyes at each other and he asks her if there's if they know each other if there's a history or whatever and she's like yeah we we used to talk to each other but i don't which is odd because like why not just say hey we hey how are you they were just like staring at each other it was so weird but this sends him into a f woe is me bitch boy rant about how he's sad because ricky doesn't like dudes you're just there all hot and stuff and you don't want to me wow <laughs> beautiful sexy gorgeous hot throbberama smart amazing bombshell girl sleeping in a bed right next to me don't cold untouchable unhavable unattainable brick wall dinosaurus rex and you know what this terrible f movie does it wants us to feel bad for him so guess what happened yes Yes, bitch. She gives him pity pussy. And it is some of the most milk toast, we the big sex I've ever seen in my f life. That whole diatribe he went on about the strong resilience of the penis. And he just lays there like a dead roly poly in the sun. She tells him like, hey, after this, after this gig is over, after this job is over, I'm leaving just so you know. The next day, Lewis calls and asks them all to meet except Brian, leave Brian at home. The man that they were kidnapping Brian for, the guy in New York, is in town. That man also gives us a long drawn out monologue about thumbs and what makes a man intimidating. And then he shoots Lewis in the face. It's graphic as shit too. They show like his brain slipping into the fish tank and the fish going eating at it. It's again, wild as fuck or a lighthearted feel-good film, I gotta say. Apparently he didn't approve of the plan that Lewis had him doing of kidnapping the dude in the first place. He's like, that's a very stupid thing to do because guess what? Now we're under scrutiny from the law. He also knows that the thumb wasn't from Brian. They got to test it, wrong fingerprints. This is of course told via monologue. And obviously he's, you know, a little volatile and he's essentially alluding to possibly killing them as well. But Ricky responds, 
with a monologue about how it would be very stupid kill us when we're the only people that know where Brian is and we're the only people that can rectify this issue. So like, let us go and we can do that. And they start playing the rom-com music. So it's like, da 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 da, -da. we're out of the mob. <laughs> like, so they go back, take Brian and basically agree to take him back to where they found him. On the drive, Gili prepares to confess to Ricky about his love for her. I don't think I could ever be what you really want. Are you listening? She's gay. But on the drive to bring Brian back to the facility that it was at originally, they end up passing what seems to be a filming of a Baywatch type show. They decide that they're gonna just drop Brian off there and leave him. They call somebody who would be like the boys of the prosecutor to come and pick up Brian and let them know where he is. But he was like, yeah, we're gonna just drop him off. He, he says like, you're a good kid or something to Brian, but he never like, tells him don't tell them about the time you've spent with us. So nothing to like clear their name or clear where he was staying or clear anything. He's just like, okay. They set him off at the beach. He meets a girl with an Australian accent, which he really likes the Australian accent. So he was on cloud nine. He gives Ricky his car for some reason. What, why are you giving her your car? Don't you need to get away? <laughs> and then he says, if she ever thinks about hopping the fence sexually, <laughs> the gay fence, if you will, let him be the first guy that she calls. <laughs> and then she like passionately kisses him and takes his car. And I'm like, okay, is that the end of the movie? That also is terrible, but no, she doesn't go. She comes back. And then they both get in the car and she, she like, uh, says, I can at least give you a drive out of town. She also tells him that her real name is Rochelle, not Ricky. And they drive out of town. That's the end of the movie. Hallelujah. That last 20 minutes is a gauntlet, bitch. That last 20 minute is only for the survival of the fittest, my guy. This movie reached a level of suck that only few ever have. I feel like this movie is exciting to only people that truly love this particular type of bad movie. So maybe watch it if you think you'd be into it. This movie is an experience. I'm happy that I made this video. Uh, if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. Uh, if you want to check out In Defense of my podcast, I always forget to plug it. That's on the More Butter channel. If I remember, I'll link that down below. And especially when that video comes out. Uh, that was like my initial reactions to watching the film. I was giddy. <laughs> Um, if you would like to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD, and I will see you guys next time.